talk about child malnutrition and social protection, and I want to introduce the next panel to you, Dr. Elizabeth Christiansen from University of Ottawa. Welcome up. Here comes Betsy. Uh, she is. Um, she works at the School of Psychology and is a measurement specialist within population and health. And we'll talk about child malnutrition. Also, welcome Mr. Armando Barrientos. Oh, welcome. Um, professor and research director at the Brooks World Poverty Institute. Please be seated. <laughs> and we'll talk about social protection programs, what that is uh, a mega trend in the world right now. And also welcome Iara Costaleite, uh, Research Associate, Associate at the South South Corporation Research and Policy Center in Brazil. Flied in from Brasilia last night, who would talk about South South Corporation. Well, as we speak, <laughs> yes. every minute, every hour, children die out of malnutrition. Yes. Actually, um, our stats show that 300 children die every hour because they don't receive enough food. Um, and also, if, and even if children do not die, they can be permanently impaired. Undernutrition represents a huge loss of potential. Children don't grow as much as they can. They don't develop intellectually if they don't get enough food. They often don't attend school or don't finish school. And it's been shown that lifetime earnings are severely impacted by undernutrition in early childhood. So this is an extreme challenge. It's an extreme challenge. Um, the, can I have the slides move? Yes, you can move it. With oh, I can one. move it. There you go. Ah. OK. Um, and it's been estimated that almost half a billion of children, children around the world are at risk over the next 15 years. So it's a huge, huge issue. And what does it look like? How is the situation today in the world? I mean well, uh, the situation has improved a little. And to, in talking about the whole burden of undernutrition, in 2009, more than a billion people were undernourished. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates now that it's down to a mere uh, 900 million. So we still uh, have a, a huge problem, a yes. huge problem. We have not by any means uh, even approached the M Millennium Development Goals. You, you have looked a little bit about the preschool and school feeding programs. Um, how do they work and where and what domains? Okay, um, basically these programs for young children, they, they actually start prenatally, but the ones we've looked at started about age three months. Um, and there are also, we've also looked at programs where children are fed in school. And for young children, they became can be given in the daycare, in preschools, in what they call feeding centers, which you're probably familiar with, or they can be delivered to the home. And for school-aged children, they're, they're just given in school uh, and as a perk for attending school. Sometimes they draw children to school. And how does it work? Does it work well? Or? That's a good question. Yeah. It works sort of well. It can work a lot better. For example, for the preschool feeding programs, we should see a large impact on growth. Children should grow more, they should gain more weight, gain more height. But in fact, we're only seeing in preschool feeding programs a gain of about a quarter of a centimeter a year. Um, that's not huge. It's something, but it, it's not as, as much as it could be. And in in terms of intellectual performance, we are seeing that children who are fed um, walk earlier, they talk earlier, um, and they run an earlier. And also there is some impact on later intellectual development, about six points in IQ in one study. There could be a lot more. And school feeding, um, it has been shown that children who are fed, especially at breakfast, there's very strong evidence for feeding early in the day at school. They they attend more, they're more motivated to learn, more interested in their surroundings, and they especially seem to improve in math. Oh, really? Yeah, it's quite interesting. There's very strong evidence for improvements in math performance, probably because of the attention 
need it and uh, the frontal, um, the executive functioning. But you say they grow, but they, they don't grow enough? So well, basically, uh, we know from the good studies, the studies that give a lot of energy, that supervise well, that uh, really follow up and work with the families and the communities, that they can grow more, um, you know, a centimeter a year rather than a quarter of a centimeter a year. So emo is more food needed or are there other circumstances Well. Then? Well, basically what seems to happen um, is that several studies we've looked at actually um, assess dietary intake. So they talk to the parents, and the parents are remarkably honest um, about what happens to the food. Um, in preschool feeding programs, we found when the food is delivered to the home, children actually only benefit from about a third of the supplement. When it's given in daycares and preschools, children benefit from about 75% of the supplement. And so where does the rest go? Where does the rest go? That's a good question. Sometimes, um, and this is natural for a family, parents redistribute the food within the family. So instead of giving it just to the one child who's supposed to receive the feeding, they share it. And you would too, naturally, as a parent. You would share it with all of your children, and sometimes with the adults who are also hungry. When it's given at school, they may give the child less food at home. Um, and if it's a, and children may also eat less of the supplement. If it's a high volume food, they may not be able to eat it all, or it may reduce their hunger later. Um, and also, we found what people euphemistically refer to as pipeline breaks. We all know about those pipeline breaks, probably. The food just doesn't even get to the targeted families or to the schools. Uh, somewhere along the line, someone else siphons it off or sells it or something like that. We have less evidence for that. It's harder to prove, but um, parents in one study in Brazil, one program in Brazil, a national program, said that they only receive the milk and oil 50% of the time. So on half of the days that they were supposed to receive it, they did not get it. So it goes somewhere it else. It goes somewhere else. But are there some programs that are really good and working? I mean, what works? What works um, is, I have, I think what works, and this has been constantly emphasized throughout this day, I've heard it from every speaker, yeah. work with the community. Develop the program in, in the community. Don't just come in with a, an already developed supplement. Uh, work with the community, talk to them, about the leaders and the parents and even the children about what will work, how it will work. Um, get them bu to buy in and to own the program. Develop foods that are culturally appropriate and that tastes good. <laughs> God. Um, and important. clearly supervise. Ma monitor at every step along the supply chain. I probably don't need to tell you that, but there are many places where the supply chain can be broken. Monitor. Talk to the parents about what their child are, is taking in and how they could do better. Um, what else works? Targeting the most undernourished children. I think one of the previous speakers mentioned that aid isn't always getting to the poorest people. Well, we know that if, if the, the poorest and most undernourished children are fed, they can do better. In fact, the most undernourished children respond better to feeding. Um, they are the ones who develop better, who grow more, and who respond more inter intellectually. And also, um, give a very high proportion of the recommended daily allowance for um, energy. Those programs that are most successful give at least 40 sometimes 60 or 70 percent of the recommended energy. And that is because you allow for the redistribution, which doesn't always impact on the child, but it can also impact the whole family. So by giving more of the energy, you're allowing for that redistribution. You do have to consider the child's age and breastfeeding needs. You don't want to disrupt breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. um, Foods should be palatable, I already mentioned that, and energy dense, so a high amount of calories and protein and micronutrients for the volume. Um, and consider giving the food as a snack. If it's pitched to the parents and the community as a snack, they're not as likely to, to cut down on the regular meals. Mm. And in the school, give the food early in the day so that the children can be more attentive and motivated to learn. Thank you so far.
Armando, you have um, you have looked into social protection programs. Uh, could you first explain what you mean by social protection? Um, yes, um, there, there has been a, a amazing growth in uh, developing countries, both uh, middle-income and low-income countries, of um, programs providing direct transfers in cash and sometimes in kind to families in extreme poverty. Um, the kind of the core concept behind them is that if you can um, provide re reliable and regular transfers uh, to families that improve their nutrition and improve their capacity to organize their proactive resources, that that will is, is more likely to have a um, sustainable impact uh, on poverty. Now, um, th there are kind of differences in the way in which we use the term social protection in European countries and when we look at developing countries. I guess Europeans would, would um, be particularly um, uh, would, would associate social protection with um, contributory social insurance programs. Um, in developing countries, uh, the, uh, the social protection programs that I um, in, uh, introduce uh, tend to be tax finance rather than finance from contributions from workers uh -huh. and have the direct objective of addressing poverty. So, uh, in trying to make the translation to kind of a European context, uh, what we're talking about about in developing countries is, uh, is an amazing growth of social assistance. Uh. And that could be, for example, uh, could, you, could you describe a program for a family? Uh, uh, you get <coughs> X amount of dollars every week? Yes, I mean, uh, roughly, and this is a very kind of rough rule of thumb uh, from my kind of uh, experience of um, learning about different programs, is that on, on average, uh, the transfers amount to about 20% of household consumption. So it's a, it's a supplement to their income and their, uh, and their consumption, rather than kind of a, a very large uh, sum. But um, uh, the, the other point to have in mind is that most of these programs have developed uh, through kind of domestic policy discussions. So they tend to be very different, very diverse across different regions. Uh, if, you, um, if you look at Latin American countries, for example, there has been a very rapid growth of what they refer to as uh, conditional cash transfer programs, where the transfers are given to families in extreme poverty uh, on condition that children are at school for 85% of the time, on condition that um, the ha ha house school members take advantage of uh, primary health care. And sometimes they also include some kind of nutrition supplement, as, as we were discussing. But in, in other countries, in, in, for example, in, in, in India, the um, uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme provides uh, um, a, a guarantee of um, 100 days on demand for families in, uh, with, with unemployed heads of household in rural areas. So there the transfer is associated with, with, with work. Uh, you said it's been an explosion of uh, social protection <coughs> programs uh, among donors. Uh, why is that? Why, had, why, why uh, is that? Uh, well, I mean, th th let me sort of try to quantify the, the explosion first. Um, um, from uh, the year 2000, more or less, uh, starting from a very low base, um, many, many countries have introduced larger scale programs. Um, we estimate um, through a database of social assistance programs that we um, collect in at Manchester University, we estimate that by the year 2010, uh, something between three quarters of a billion and one billion people wow. in developing countries live with someone in some other member in the household who had uh, access to one of these transfers. So it's a very rapid growth if you, if you imagine from a very low base in 2000 to um, reaching, say, one billion people by the year 2010. Now, the, 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 the interesting thing is why is this happening? And I think that, uh, uh, firstly, um, many uh, developing country governments are committed to poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. And I think they have come to an understanding that economic growth and basic services are essential to address poverty, but that is not sufficient to reach the uh, groups which are, are face the greatest social exclusion. That in addition to uh, improving basic services we've been discussing, providing um, opportunities for employment, um, and self-employment, it is also important to uh, reach and include those groups um, which are in extreme vulnerability and extreme poverty. And, and the other point which I, I would add is, is democratization. Uh, 
mm. because the, uh, for example, in Africa over the last uh, 10 years or so, the uh, number of governments that are not elected uh, are, I think, three. Uh, in Latin America, uh, after the spate of dictatorships in the 1980s and early 90s, um, um, we've had a very solid uh, democracy since then. And I think democratization helps um, those groups that are excluded from, f first of all, finding a voice, and secondly, um, um, getting a response from governments. Yes. <coughs> but so it's a megatrend, yes. But how effective is it? Um, it, it, is, uh, it is very effective. I mean, uh, 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 anti-poverty transfers are probably one of the most uh, evaluated or most rigorously evaluated interventions uh, in development. Uh, that um, uh, has... The, the, the reason for this, the, the kind of strength and robustness of evaluation has really to do with politics. Um, in, in many countries, including European countries, uh, giving transfers in cash to people in poverty uh, has a, a, a resistance, um, especially from better off groups and, um, mm -hmm. and others. So that as a means of addressing that political resistance, uh, evaluation systems can, can help uh, to pave the way for kind of a stable and sustainable interventions. But uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of impact, I got one um, slide that I wanted to show you, which relates to um, what Elizabeth was saying. Uh, in, in, um, in, in, in Mexico in 1997, the, the government introduced a program um, called Progresa, which is now called Oportunidades, providing transfers to families with children of a school age in uh, rural areas and in extreme poverty. The, the government, uh, because of the kind of political resistance which I was um, referring to just now, uh, the, the program agency introduced very tough um, evaluation systems for the, for the, for the program. Uh, and, and, and also they took advantage of the fact that the program could not be introduced in all um, 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 uh, parts of Mexico at the same time. So it was introduced gradually. So in 1998, um, you know, um, uh, there was one ex in expansion of the program. And then uh, some um, um, communities that were meant to be in incorporated into the program could in fact not be incorporated until two years later in 2000. Yeah. So you have an ideal situation where you can, uh, you can look at um, eligible households in, in 1998, what happened to them in 2000, and you can compare those that were incorporated in the program in 98 and those that only were incorporated in the program in 2000. And what you have here is an indication of the impact of the program. <coughs> if you measure the height for age um, and you make a comparison between uh, uh, those that were incorporated in the program in 98 and those that came into the program in 2000, the difference is one centimeter. And that is that is hugely lot, yeah, yeah is, is, is hugely indicative of the impact of the program on the long term nutrition of the children, which as as Elizabeth was saying, has implications for education and ultimately their whole lives. So if you would give <coughs> recommendation when it comes to social uh, those programs, social protection programs, what would that be for uh, for donators or for international aid? Right. Uh, in, in terms of the, the role of international aid, uh, if, I could, if I could use Hollywood speak, um, uh, what, we're yeah. what we're talking here is really a supporting role rather than a star role, right? <laughs> uh, because I, I think um, aid has a, 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 an important role to play, but it's also a very limited role in, in, in the sense that uh, financing the transfers uh, for people in poverty must be financed out of domestic resources, Re yeah. right? Yeah. Um, in the long term, that is what generates the legitimacy, the sustainability uh, uh, that associated with the programs. The, the role of international aid, though, is important, first of all, in, in trying to uh, reduce the setup costs, particularly for low-income countries. Um, these programs require an investment in uh, capacities, um, kind of social workers, program agents. It requires uh, information systems. It requires registration, uh, both birth registration for children and registration for adults too. Uh, it requires means of transferring cash, 
um, financial systems, and it, it requires um, uh, ev monitoring and evaluation. All those things are really expensive, and they are a barrier, particularly for low-income countries. And the experience of most uh, countries with large-scale programs has been that A has facilitated that process initially. And then, on top of that, you, you, have, you have two other important roles for aid. One is to uh, finance research on, 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 on these programs. Again, it's self-serving. I'm an academic, so I would, yeah. I would say that. But that is, that is really it's important. It's always said it's really important. true. Uh, and then uh, I think how, how to transfer the experiences um, from southern countries to other southern countries. And I think Yara will, will speak on that issue uh, in, exactly. in a minute. I think that is really important uh, because there is a lot of learning that needs to take place across uh, development regions on how to make these programs effective and sustainable. Yara, South-South Cooperation, um, what, is, what is that? Could you give an example of that? When we talk about South-South Cooperation, we're talking about um, a multi-faced uh, phenomena. It, we're talking about several modalities, uh, including it. I think the one that uh, it's most of the interest today here is South-South Development Cooperation. But I think we we have to to see how diverse these uh, these events are in international relations. And I brought some examples. We usually refer to it as any type of uh, cooperative relation engaging a socially organized group that is based in the South, that is in developing countries. So a socially organized group, maybe a, st a state uh, or, or a firm or uh, an NGO, right? And uh, uh, we're talking about, uh, there you have some examples, coalitions among develop, developing countries, right? Like the IPSA initiative or the BRICS, it said like uh, develop a uh, South-South coalition. South-South uh, trade and investments, uh, cooperation in science and technology, South-South policy exchanges, regional and inter regional integration, and South-South development cooperation. All of those um, modalities are usually treated as South-South cooperation. But I think what, what is important to mention is that differently from North-North cooperation or North-South cooperation, uh, South-South cooperation does not necessarily result from an interdependence am among these countries. Actually, it, it, it is an instrument to foster interdependency among them. So this is important because we're, uh, we're talking about links in multiple areas that are, are these countries want to build with each other because they believe that uh, their relationships will be more equal and will bring more benefits to both parties. But we're talking about an expectation that has to be proved empirically in a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, approach. So, so Brazil, for example, your country, um, has this kind of South-South cooperation. So what could that be? Give an example, example yeah, of Brazil. Yeah, I just brought some some examples here. This is just uh, to, for you to, to see that South-South uh, development cooperation is the interface among South-South cooperation and international development cooperation. And I think the IPSA case brings all those modalities, or most of them, right? The IPSA was, is a dialogue uh, for, uh, forum engaging Brazil, uh, South Africa, and India that was created in 2003. And it has this aspect of the most important one uh, relates to political coordination. These countries meet every uh, in multilateral meetings before the meetings, so they, uh, they have a consensus on how they will vote in, uh, in an issue in the multilateral set setting. This is the most successful part of it. We have uh, market integration. Uh, but it's not going very well, actually. There is an attempt to foster policy, ex policy exchange in several areas, and including in education, social development, and health. But it's working, it's very slow, because we're talking about bureaucracies that are self-referenced 
and they, they, they are not able to exchange things with, with each other, except in some cases, and the exceptions are in science and, tech, in technology, and oh. in, um, I mean, the, it's very difficult to foster this process because of the type of uh, these bureaucracies. Um, we have, uh, I put there, a multi-stakeholder engagement. We have forums engaging business, women, parliamentary, uh, editors, and others. And we also have the, the um, trust fund, the IPSA fund, which is the, a modality of South-South development cooperation. It's, uh, these countries put $1 million uh, each every year for funding projects in less developed countries. And that's, there, there that's are a very lot of interesting money. initiatives in there. So when it works, you pointed out that some like political coordination works, and some of them didn't work. When it works, uh, why does it work then? Why it works in yeah. political coordination? No, when it works, I mean, how do you make it work? Or what are the main thing where it works? And why is that? Well, I think that you need, you need to really have a coordination. If this is something about international cooperation in general, it has to be spontaneous. Uh, sometimes things are induced and they won't work if the induced partners are not, don't understand why that is important. So I think in the case of political coordination, we're talking about a di diplomatic levels. Yeah. They are more aware, they actually lead these initiatives, right? So uh, it's just to uh, to give an example uh, about South South development cooperation. I just brought there some opportunities and challenges. Of course, we have additional resources for international development cooperation. We're talking about similar challenges, and um, I mean all uh, developing countries face the challenge of developing in a politically correct world. You know how important, how uh, differentiated that is, because developed countries didn't develop uh, respecting human rights or the environment, and you know that. So the chance of learning with other southern countries facing the same, these same challenges is bigger. We're talking about uh, relations of trust, and th this trust comes from the fact that it's not driven by offers and that. Uh, um, the, the 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 demands from less developed developed countries are are considered, and that creates a relationship of trust, and all the thing is, the thing about non interference in domestic affairs and listening to what the country wants. Of course, there is a challenge in that because what the what an elite wants is not actually what the people mm. want. So working with both of those dimensions is very important to foster not only official cooperation, but also cooperation among civil societies in uh, southern countries. And the thing about inspiration, that, that thing that if, if Brazil did it, we can do it. This, that was cr crucial, for instance, for the, the cash transfer program in Ghana, right? It was, uh, it was very important for the, the minister to tell her people that Brazil did it, and this created a, a condition for acceptance of the, the program. And then we have some challenges, and I think that going back to what does not work, the feeling I have is that uh, 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 best practice transfer does not work. And this is what's happening in South-South development cooperation. It's very important for us to remember that one of the factors that has favored this uh, reemergence of South-South development cooperation was the attempt of traditional donors to re reconstruct their, legis their legitimacy in international development cooperation after neoliberalism and uh, the, the social problems of the social impacts of economic globalization. So this is, uh, th these countries and, and agencies started inducing South-South cooperation as uh, as a best practice um, transfer, and, and contexts are very particular. This mm. is very important to remember. Uh, cash transfers in Brazil uh, worked. One of the reasons for, for it have working was that uh, the government, Brazilian government, has a very powerful tax 
structure. So uh, you can't just you can't disconnect results from the the, the legal and the political and the social context and economic context of this, these countries. So I think this is, uh, this is one of the biggest challenges. And I don't know if I have time to tell me I can. Uh, you have, yeah, a little time. OK. And I put there the thing about coordination. I have some data here from the Brookings Institute that it's just it's scary uh, to know that, uh, for instance, um, in 2007, the recipient countries uh, spent uh, two, 263 days a year receiving international delegations. I mean, we're talking about restricted, wow. restricted human resources in poor countries uh, that, are, that are being allocated to receive international missions. And this, this data is in general, and it was in 2007. You can imagine after, after that, several cooperation agencies have been created, including in southern countries. And I think the greatest challenge is for this coordination to happen. And remembering that southern countries, emerging donors, are no different from traditional ones in the sense that South-South cooperation is used as an instrument for, uh, in foreign policy in, in related to diplomatic purposes and economic purposes as well. And in these countries, we don't have constituencies supporting aid as you have in here, in Sweden, clearly. So uh, interests are fundamental to create these constituencies at home. But the thing is, how do you guarantee a, a constituency and at the same time the effectiveness in field? And for that, coordination would be very important. But they don't want their names to be dissolved in the middle of a multi-stakeholder initiative. They really want to use it as an instrument to further it's a dilemma, right? It's a dilemma, yeah. yes. I think we will let now a little bit earlier uh, questions and remarks from the audience. If we have the uh, microphones, we have one here because I... And we have you there, lady. And then um, s what about the students over there? Huh? Hmm? Some questions, remarks, more than those two? Um, three. Okay, please. I'm just going to give three examples of South-South cooperation because... Uh, um, in the mid 2010s, 2000, um, Rwanda was a recipient of um, support from Cuba. We, we did lack really a, a specialist for the main hospital, King, King Faisal Hospital. And South Africa paid actually the salaries of these people to come for a, a given number of years. And that was, I thought it was a very important South South cooperation. Uh, the countries in, in Sadek, all the countries, most, uh, the student will study at uh, like, uh, local fees when they, they are admitted in South African universities, which is very, very important. And the third example is uh, with my academy. So most of the issues that you outlined here, being uh, health, mostly in the health issues like uh, nutrition, are science issues. So science is very, very important at the global level. So there are many countries that are lagging behind in science and technology. So the Academy of Science for the Developing World has worked with uh, China, India, Brazil, Malaysia, Mexico, and uh, Argentina. So these countries have accepted to do a South-South cooperation science and technology. So th they pay the full tuition, the full tuition, and twice the academy pays a ticket to go from the country of origin to China, to Brazil, to Malaysia uh, to study and back home, and that's something. Thank you. Um, where were there? Yeah. Do you have a microphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Gunnel Axelsson, the Kammer Church of Sweden International Department, uh, and we're very happy to hear the presentation, especially by, by Amanda Barrientos, because we think social protection is really a, a very important area of development cooperation that has been. Uh, I would say very much neglected, and I think it's the, the potential in terms of, of uh, poverty reduction and attrition and school enrollment and everything uh, is quite um, quite big. Uh, now, Armand, you said that the role of uh, development corporations in, is important but limited. 
going back to the picture that Miguel showed this morning about the different sectors within allocation of, of social uh, expenditure within the social sectors, it was said here that water and sanitation was the poor cousin. I mean, social protection wasn't even in the picture. Uh, I wonder if, if the, uh, and this is perhaps a question to Miguel, whether social protection was in the, in the picture, but so small we couldn't see it. Uh, and if so, or anyhow, why is it that the, uh, this potential law is now not, not fulfilled today? But it has exploded, hasn't it? Right. But that is uh, domestic finance. I mean, yeah. it was emphasized that mostly it's uh, domestically financed. Okay, and then we had there. And then comments from you. Hi, um, my name is Sophie and I'm from the Institute for Security and Development Policy. My question is about South-South cooperation. Um, with a little bit of experience from the Pacific Islands, um, when talking about post-2015 agendas, the main thing that they had learned and were passionate about from the MDGs was the lessons of mistakes learnt in the Caribbean and Asia, Asian countries. And they asked um, with a particular emphasis to learn about previous mistakes from other countries, more so than best practices. How much uh, in South-South cooperation is there an emphasis on being very honest about mistakes mm -hmm. made and how to avoid them then on best practices going forward? Thank you. So who wants to start commenting? Armando? Okay. Um, on, on, the, on the question about why is that sort of the um, share of faith that is going to social protection is so small, um, um, I have... I have kind of three three main points. The, the first one is that uh, the structure of, of aid is really not suitable for institution building uh, because it's too short, because it's usually project-based, uh, and because usually there isn't that uh, level of discussion and dialogue between the donors and the recipients. Uh, so um, uh, the, the, the term structure the, uh, is, is perhaps the most significant one. Um, you don't build institutions in two or three years. And, and really, so the expansion of social protection in developing countries uh, is not just a, an intervention as a development intervention. It's very different to, say, um, addressing malaria or addressing kind of water, uh, water issues. What, what you need is to build uh, perhaps long-term institutions that could um, address poverty now and prevent poverty in the future. Uh, and I think there is a kind of mismatch there between um, the way that they is set up and the way in which um, uh, uh, the, the requirements for uh, supporting the expansion of social protection. Uh, there is also, I think, a, a, a political issue in that um, our kind of perception of aid is very much to do with emergency assistance or humanitarian assistance. If, you, if we look at the pictures that come up on TV, uh, depicting aid is usually someone kind of lifting kind of sacks of rice and mm. sort of giving it to people. And of course, the, the, the uh, humanitarian and emergency assistance are very important, but um, having longer term institutions addressing poverty might actually be better in a sense and that has been the experience of donors in sub-Saharan Africa in, where they have really supported social protection as a means of moving away from annual rounds of emergency assistance to more stable uh, ways of addressing uh, problems of food insecurity and nutrition. So I think those, those, are, the, those are the reasons. There are course, other more technical ones. Um, there is a difference between loans and grants. I don't think it makes sense for developing country governments to borrow money to provide transfers. So we're looking at really grants rather than loans. And there is the issue of absorption capacity, especially low-income countries have a limited capacity to absorb additional funds. Um, there are kind of prudential issues associated with it too. And, and those come, in, come into play uh, as well. So that, for all those reasons, that, that's why I kind of... Um, my, my kind of way of looking at it is that uh, aid has an important but a very specific limited role uh, in, in advancing social protection. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add on that? No, please. Uh, 
thanks for, for the question. Uh, I think that's, that's the point, but at the same time, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I said about the bureaucracies being self-referenced, but I'm still uh, I'm self-referenced as well. I come from a whale country, as you know. It's a big country. We're still trying to find out how things work inside Brazil in the cooperation, uh, in the South-South cooperation. But there is this example. Uh, Brazil, uh, Brazilian uh, national policies, uh, now that um, we... They're, they, it's more mature, it's not being induced anymore by traditional donors. There is a process of uh, ownership, right, mm. concerning uh, the exporting of Brazilian experiences. But what is happening is that uh, policies are being exported as an instrument to strengthen them at home. Mm. So it's, it, the way they are exported is a lot more like about, my, about propaganda. Because the, the aim is to uh, strengthen them yeah. at home. Um, so in this process, there, there is a, a exactly, that's what you said, uh, learning about bad experience, not so good experiences might be a lot more important. I mean, we have uh, this program that is being exported today to Africa, the food purchase program. Uh, there are some not, not so good experiences in the state of Piauí, for instance, is the poorest state in Brazil, of, the f of uh, producers not being able to deliver the food to the, the schools because they have no transportation. Uh -huh. I mean, why? What happened? Uh, how could... Uh, maybe we have examples of a community that faced exactly this challenge, and what did this community do to... Did to overcome this challenge in Brazil. I think these experiences would be more important. And maybe uh, th this is the path for exchange. And th this is yeah. exactly why, what we are not having in South-South cooperation. I mean, one mutual learning. Maybe uh, putting someone from the state of Piauí to talk to people in Africa and, and, and exchange would be more... Uh, effective, right? But yeah. uh, I, I always like to insist that we're not talking about a technical issue. This is a political issue after all. So how do we deal with the, the political aspects of it? And I wanted to change uh, subject a little bit, having you from uh, Brazil here. Um, we have new donor countries um, like Brazil and China. How would uh, the three of you say that uh, this changed the situation among donors? Is there a difference now? I want to pick up on that. Armando? Uh, yes, I do. I think it makes a great deal of difference. Uh, certainly in terms of the policies of the G20, the involvement of countries like India, South Africa and Brazil in discussions on social policy made a great deal of difference in terms of the orientation, for example, of the kind of global stimulus package in the context of the crisis. So I think that, that has made uh, a difference. The, the, the other kind of um, um, area where it has made a difference is that um, not everything has to go up to Washington or kind of European capitals and then down again. And in the process, you perhaps lose some of the kind of, uh, uh, some of the good things about kind of policy diffusion. I think that is really important. Um, Yara was sort of mentioning the case of uh, cooperation between Brazil and, and, and Af Sub-Saharan African countries on, on uh, social transfers, for instance. And, and she mentioned that um, South as cooperation is best when you have a mutual learning process. The, the way that that program works is really interesting. Uh, Brazil is a huge country, 160 million people, vast uh, territory. Um, now, Br Brazilians can always find a municipality in Brazil that has conditions similar to those uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that want to introduce a, 
a, a social transfer program. So in the case of Ghana, they could find municipalities with similar conditions. So policymakers from Ghana that visited Brazil said, well, uh, you know, yes, of course we can do it because our, the conditions in terms of infrastructure and so on are, 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 are similar. So that, that particular program, um, the Brazil Africa program, has been extremely influential, not just on uh, Portuguese speaking countries in South Saharan Africa, but across kind of West, Central, and Eastern Africa, in persuading those countries that it is, it is feasible to introduce that. So I think that, that, that is important. I, I think also there is a, um, a greater emphasis uh, as a consequence of the participation of. Um, of the um, uh, South Africa, Brazil, and India, on on a focus on social policy perceived more broadly than just very specific interventions on, say, health, education, and social protection. Um, much more of a systems approach, which some of the uh, this, um, um, s some of the presenters earlier kind of referred to it as as as, as a good thing. So, but has this <coughs> changed in any way the way that traditional donor countries act? Or is it just that we have new players and they play another game? Or have they changed the, the play as a whole? Uh, I, I think, my, in my experience, it's, yeah. it's, it's really intrigued them in the sense of, you know, what are they going to do that yeah. is different? Um, uh, for example, I'm, um, I'm about to start a program uh, in May looking at, the Bra at Brazil's development model and its implication for Africa. This was funded by DFID because they, they, they really don't know very much about how the Brazil development model works. And they want to see how it would operate in the context of sub-Saharan African countries. So I think there is, there is a kind of... Uh, they are intrigued as to what these countries can do that they have been successful in doing in the past. <coughs> Any comments, questions? Um, all right. So we have. <coughs> well, who was there? Are you okay? One, two, three. Yeah. Uh, maybe okay. Uh, maybe Abby you. first. Yeah. Yes. Can I start? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Uh, two comments. First, on on the statement that on the role of aid and saying that that domestic financing. Uh, uh, has to be more important than aid. I think whenever you do that statement, you need to qualify it according to which country you're talking about. Uh, in countries where they basically can afford the intervention we are discuss discussing, of course, domestic financing has to play a major role. But in countries where they cannot afford uh, the intervention we are discussing, aid has, of course, quite another uh, role to play, and we're talking here about countries from a GDP of 10,000 US dollars down to 500 US dollars, or 5,000 US dollars, and then down to 500 US dollars per capita. And the capacity of a country f with 500 compared to a country with 10,000 is, of course, completely different. So that's one point. And then also just to say on the uh, on the south to south cooperation, I think we need to distinguish between cooperation and aid. And I just want to re-emphasize re what you said, that I think if we're talking aid, uh, I think we should have no illusions that countries, just because they are geographically placed somewhere, or if they have a GDP that is slightly different, will have different uh, ideas about using aid as a foreign policy instrument and serving their own interests. So from the receiving side, you need to be just as suspicious, I think, uh, towards uh, donors, whether they are southern donors or northern donors. Thank you. Abby? A couple of the comments um, made me think about uh, you know, what you were saying about being transparent about mistakes and how difficult that is. I think all aid agencies have this problem, and it's not just between humanitarian and development aid. It's, it's more apparent with development aid than humanitarian aid. Basically, people give money when there's a uh, you know, disaster. But the whole point about agencies being transparent about how difficult it is to create sustainable development would mean educating the public in a way that would change the way in which I'm sure we all know, oh, but you know, the public needs to know 
that we're accountable for the money spent. Yes, they do, in ways that are different from those in which we are choosing to tell them about that accountability. If we widen the nature of that accountability to ha having educated them, I think we can have a lot more leeway for institutional development from aid. Thank you. Arnon? Um, at Bradford, we have been working with the China Development Bank for the last four or five years, and that has been a very interesting learning experience for us. And we are trying to learn more. It's not uh, very easy. Um, for donors, I think we have a lot more information published in a traditional way, so we can do kind of analysis, etc. But with the new this kind of uh, development contributors or development donors, um, especially with China, we find that there is a lot of intervention which we don't really know about. And in a paper that um, Tony Edison and I have done um, last year, uh, looking just at infrastructure, who is putting how much in terms of infrastructure investment in Africa, we did find that you know China's contribution is is very large. Now, to even to get that kind of a figure, it was really very difficult it, looking at annual reports and things like that. That is one of, I think, is the challenges when we are trying to understand the n new donors. Of course, we do understand they have their own priorities and um, quite a lot of bilateral discussions with individual countries. And some of development finance is not identified separately. It is um, channeled in kind, and therefore it's very difficult to measure. Um, I think those are kind of challenges which they are aware of, but for us especially when trying to understand the bigger picture, it is really very difficult mainly because of that. And on top of that then there are all these kind of claims whether um, the new donors are picking particular countries, for example natural resource based or right. you know whether, um, I, I think that kind of a criticism should not be singled out for these new donors. I think that has always been the you know, impure altruism kind of uh, argument or conditional aid or whatever. Um, so I, th I think with the new donors, the development flows or development assistance flows in a very different way. Many of that, much of that may not be measured. It may be not visible in the traditional ways in which we used to measure development assistance. So that's why it is very difficult for us to actually get the bigger picture. When, where we are able to unpack, we do find that it is really significant and it does make a difference. And just last point about China, we tend to think of China, China's role, especially in Africa, as building airports or bypasses, but they also have a very significant, for example, microfinance program for uh, um, uh, rural farmers in Malawi, things like that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we break for lunch, um, if you would give donors in the room or on the web in the world, each one, one really good advice, your best advice, what would that be? Um, I think we've, said, we've all said it here, work with the countries, work with the people who will actually be receiving the aid, the communities and the people themselves, the parents, the children, understand what they need, um, what will work, what they will eat, what will work for them. Ask more. Yeah. Ask more. Uh, Armando. Uh, my kind of uh, advice was already said by Iana, who uh, s stole my main point. <laughs> right now. She, she said something that was uh, that is really important, and, and it's this: that um, we don't usually associate the social sector's expenditure with with the resources needed in developing countries to support them. That is, we got to associate social sector expenditure with taxation. With, with revenue collection. And m m my advice, which you know, already mentioned, is that perhaps what we should do in developing countries is first of all try to see what can be done to strengthen domestic revenue uh, collection. Well, my advice will go, it's about South-South cooperation. It's not, I think traditional donors should not presume that South-South cooperation is better and will solve all the problems. I think it has a great potential for effectiveness in, I, I think, from the perception dimension. The thing about inspiration is fundamental for learning processes to, to go smoother. It's fundamental, but it, uh, 
we can't presume that it's all fine, we, that, I mean, let's just stimulate it to happen. We really need to have uh, ev evaluation in field uh, for, for this potential to be uh, expanded. Thank you. We have the donors in the room and after lunch that will be served just outside here. After lunch, we will meet them here and hear what they picked up during this day and at all. And welcome back then. We see you here in one hour, two o'clock, and have a nice lunch. Thank you, and an applause. <laughs>